Kia ora, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm sitting here with my friend, Roy Burnett, and we hope you enjoy this episode. So I pretty much introduce everyone on this podcast as my friend. Uh, mm-hmm. Most people I meet like just on the day and I get to know them, but I, we're actually friends. We are actually friends. And, and we're back to where it all started. So for those yes. of you who don't know, like we are recording in an office that we used to work in. So mm-hmm. Roy Burnett here, who we have, we actually met, uh, it would have been a couple of years ago now, and then we had to share an office. And I'm, I already, we already know that I don't like social and just being <laughs> with other people. So I was having to share an office with you. Yes, every day. Yeah. Every like day for a year. Every day for a year and not even knowing who you were before that and then to be this close now. It's kind of awesome. It is kind of awesome. Did yeah. You, did you like that you had to share an office with me though? I think at the start I was a little bit, oh, who's, who is this guy? Who am I going to have to share an office with every day? And then, yeah, I actually did. Okay. It was fun. All right. And then it doesn't matter how long that I've got to know you in this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes when I interview friends, it's really easy to just jump into like the deep end of different things. And people yeah. are just like, wait, who, who even is this person? <laughs> um, but even though I've known you for this long, I still mm-hmm. don't know your timeline of where you've lived, where you were born and other places that you've gone. Because you, all I know is that you had did your high schooling here in Dunedin. Mm-hmm. You did uni here in Dunedin, uh, then you went overseas for a little bit, but now you're back and then living in Auckland. Yes. Um, without giving away too much, like you're not your address or anything like that. But <laughs> um, where, because you weren't born in New Zealand? No, I wasn't born in New Zealand. Tell me more. So I was born in Australia. Yes. Um, and I grew up in a small town in New South Wales mm-hmm. for most of my childhood. And then we moved to Fiji for a little bit. Yeah. Lived there for a little bit. Um, and then we came down to Dunedin. Right. So what was the catalyst like for the different movements? So what was what was the draw card to Australia for your family? And mm-hmm. then why to Fiji from there? And then why to Dunedin from there? Yeah. Okay. Well, my mum's from Kiribati. Yeah. Um, and so my mum uh, met my dad mm-hmm. on her, own, her home island in Kiribati. And they um, met there, got married there, and then moved to Australia because that's where my dad's from. Right. Yeah. Do you know why your dad was in Kiribati to start with? Yeah, he was a teacher. A teacher? Yeah. What type of teacher? He was a primary school, no, a secondary school teacher. Right. And my mum was a primary school teacher over there. Ah. Yeah. But was there any reason why he had, like, an excursion to go to Kiribati? I actually don't know why he ended up in Kiribati, but he was working in the Pacific as a teacher okay. before that. Right. And then ended up in Kiribati. Of all places, I have no idea why. Yeah, well, okay. That's yeah. always good to know. Um, but then, so you go, so you grew up in Australia because you've gone back to where your dad's from. And then yes. there's the move to Fiji. At about how old were you and what was the, the moving for you? Like, why? why? What was the reason? I was about nine, but all of the reasons that we've moved as a family has been because of my dad. Right. So he's a lecturer, and so we move ah, wherever he gets a job. Okay. And so we moved to Fiji because he got a job at USP. Yep. And so we lived there for a bit. Yeah. Right. At yeah. the time, like at the time, were you like? Did it startle you that you were moving so much? At or the time, cool? I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Because I got to go to like these new places, and I found it really exciting. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so then, when you moved to like Fiji, because Fiji from Australia, like that's it's. I mean, it's not something that you notice much as a child because you just go to where everything is going. Yeah. Like, where go? Like I'm just here. Okay, now I'm going to school. I was going to school in Australia. It's not that much different. But now, on reflection, what were like some of the big cool things that you learned while you were going over there? Um, I guess because I'd never lived in the Pacific before right. moving to Fiji. So I had this idea of what Fiji was going to be going to look like as yeah. a little kid. And I thought, oh, it's going to be really tropical. It's going to be this paradise. There's going to be like coconut trees everywhere. And it was definitely a bit of a different reality when I arrived in Fiji. It was not how I pictured it at right. all, but right. still really, really beautiful and things. It was just more, Fiji's actually a city, like where we lived in Suva. It's, it's not like a... Like, it's bigger than Dunedin. It's a city. So, mm. yeah. Mm. And then for you, like, education-wise and in learning, um, do they have much in terms of, like, putting Fijian culture into education? Or is it quite a Western way of education? Or um, there, So, where I went to school, it was a... Um, it was a private school, so it was a very Western education. Private girl. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> um, but it was cool in that when... Like, when you go to school, it's not... Um, there's lots of different um, Pacific cultures in right. Suva, so right. it's it's kind of like, yeah, there's a lot of diversity in Suva, which is really cool. Mm. And mm. then coming over to Dunedin, this is where you ended up spending majority of your uh, kind of formative years and then your grown-up years. Yes. Um, so, 
You come over here then. So how long were you in Fiji? About four years, three years. Yeah, and then you come in over here and you've just been like pretty much, so like you forming who you are from nine to about you know early teens, almost mm-hmm. teens, mm-hmm. and then coming here. What was that shock? Was it a shock? Oh, yeah, there was a shock All coming right, to Janine. <laughs> um, it was definitely a shock. It was weird because I um, kind of didn't realise that when you're in New Zealand, or like when, you, when you're when you in Fiji, so I'm from Kiribati and I'm from Australia, and that's kind of how I saw myself. Mm. And then when I moved to Dunedin, suddenly it was like, oh, where are you from? And I was mm. like, um, I'm from Kiribati in Australia. And they'd be like, oh, oh, so you're an islander. Right. And I was like, what's an islander? Right. <laughs> so that was a bit of a shock in terms of like how I now identified myself mm. in New Zealand. Mm. I'd never really thought of myself as an islander because that's yeah. just not how I saw myself. Right. Um, and then just, yeah, just a cultural shock in terms of being in Dunedin and going from somewhere really warm and tropical mm. um, to a Western setting and to being very cold. And yeah. Very, yeah. So back to the Islander statement, is that more just because, like, Kiribati is not considered, like, you wouldn't, con- you just consider yourself a person from Kiribati. You, you wouldn't consider yourself a Pacific Islander? I do, but at that time when I was, like, eight or nine and yeah. had never been, like, hadn't lived in New Zealand and where we grew up in Australia, like, there weren't that many Pacific people living right. in that town. And right. so I always identified myself as being Kiribati mm. and being Australian. Mm. Um, and then in Fiji as well, like, if you live in the Pacific, you're not, you don't see yourself as a yes. Pacific person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're just wherever you are from is yeah. who you are. And trying to conceptualise that to so many people is so difficult for them because I'm just like, when I'm in the Cook Islands, Mm. I am Troy. Yeah. I'm not Troy the Cook Islander. Like, we just say kia ora And that's it. Yeah. Like, you're, you are who you are. Yes. But then when you come to a place where everything is, like, stratified by categories, mm-hmm. then I think that's when, like, you just get placed into this overarching thing, which we'll get into at some point as well. Yeah. Um, but then, like, because that forms your identity. It does, yeah. yeah. And yeah. For, for, like, people trying to understand you, like, they mm. only have a very small perspective of what that is and that was straight away to be an islander that's an interesting culture shock that you brought that you brought up yeah yeah um and then for you then going into school uh and then like starting to get to know who you were did you do you feel like you just kind of assimilated to the way that new zealand culture was at high school because high school is very you know you want to be cool you want to be popular <laughs> you probably weren't that popular <laughs> no, no 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 but you you want to be um, and it's very easy to see, like, okay, the differences in me is the stuff that I need to start putting away um, so that, or, like, probably now it's a little bit different, but back then you, you'd always feel like, okay, I, I need to, I, this is different from me. I need to be like them so I can yeah. be cool. What was your yeah. road through this whole thing? Um, I think mine was a little bit different in that I kind of felt like I had to fit into two different spaces or to two different circles. Mm. So... There was like obviously being European and so like sort of fitting in with like Western culture, Mm -hmm. but then also trying to fit in with like what it meant to be a Pacific person at Mm. school. So you Mm. kind of get lumped into being an Islander if you say you're from a certain place at high school. That was my experience in Dunedin. And so you kind of now have to navigate these two different social circles of Mm. either your, your white friends or like you're hanging out with your Islander friends. Right. And is that, was that an immediate shift or was that a in-between personality that you started? Um, I guess it was an in, de- in between personality, but it was also kind of learning how to switch between contexts. That's what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you'd go from like the immediate switch. I mean, was be like you'd be in one circle, you're one way. Then yeah. You go to another circle, yeah. then you're another way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. Which I think is like a lot of people. I don't know. I'm. We're all like that. I'd say. And yeah. I, always, I always say this to people, and that when you're dealing with different people, the context shift. So like you always have respect, but how you show respect is dependent on the context. Yeah. Like how I respect my mum is different from how I show respect to my sister, to how I show respect to my best friends. Yeah, like yeah. It's still respect, but context changes. Yeah, definitely. I mm. think that's the same for like your identity. Like your identity changes in different settings. Like mm. you choose to show certain parts of yourself in yeah. different spaces. And then you get haters who are just like, you're so different when you do this. It's like, like, no, <laughs> you change. People change. It's normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, but you also have to because like a, a big thing is that you people know you in a certain light. Yeah. Right. So for you to kind of protect yourself even, I feel like you need to – to stop that, to not stop that, but to also just like shut off parts of yourself because that then leaches energy into other things that maybe 
it's not the place to be. But we're at high school. We're not thinking about that sort of stuff. Yeah. We're thinking about f- being, how to fit in. Yeah, how to be cool. Being cool, <laughs> right? Being able to wear your hat backwards with no one giving you any. I don't know. You probably never did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but seriously. So then you do go to a school, which is, I th- I'd say at the time, was what, predominantly Pakia? Yes, it was pr- predominantly Pakia. Yeah. Yep. So for you trying to then like get in and you, were you more like did you try to what I see quite a bit is, is people bringing out that island side of them a little bit more just to kind of like stamp it yeah or what, did you go the other way I kind of again like going back to what we were just talking about before I'd be strategic about it so sometimes like I'd play on the fact that yeah I'm an islander like so I can fit into certain spaces and right. then sometimes if I wanted to I could just sort of fit in a bit more if mm. I chose to mm. yeah so would you talk about like strategic in terms of advantages yeah like when i want to fit in then i'll choose to be a certain way right okay <laughs> does that make sense so you're not real <laughs> so i'm fake so we're gonna stop this <laughs> podcast right here <laughs> no no but because like uh, that's that's all stuff that i think on reflection when you when you think about it later that it's kind of it's kind of sad well yeah it's again it's a part of fitting in right mm. yeah Mm, that we get to that point where we feel like you have to only be a certain way sometimes. Yeah. Because if you're like that in another time, then someone's going to like say, oh, that, that, like this is not for you. You don't, you're, you don't belong here. Yeah. And belonging is a huge part of what gives us, well, what I think gives us like a, a safe feeling. Yeah. 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 So going through high school uh, and then thinking about going to university, did you mm-hmm. have like, were you building up a pathway in mind, keeping in mind that your father is a, you know, at, uh, he's a lecturer at mm-hmm. university. So you kind of have an idea of how um, tertiary education works. Yeah. You have a bit more of a hand in than other people. Yeah. Did that play into any of your decisions? I think, yeah, having my dad and my mum as teachers and my dad being a lecturer, I think university was kind of always something that I had thought about mm. as something that I wanted to do. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely played into what I chose to do when I finished high school. But then going through high school, did you actually have an academic pathway in mind or was it just, I'm going to school to do what I like doing? To be honest, no. Yeah. I kind of just decided that I wanted to do what I enjoyed at high school, which in hindsight, I kind of don't think was the smartest idea for me to choose something, Right. but it was kind of based on what I enjoyed at high school. And I knew that, um, I wanted to to work in the Pacific I wanted to do something in that kind of space and Mm. so I kind of chose the topics that I like so I I did French at high school yeah and I also loved um geography which turned out to be what I I majored majored in um in my first year at university okay because I like those subjects at high school (laughs) right 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 so you did a bit of French did a bit of geography (laughs) yeah when you came to uni yes and that was because you felt you were like you like you enjoyed them enough and you're also probably pretty you know competent at those yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get to uni yes. and you start realising some things. Yes. Like, so your shift in personality as well in that point, um, what did you start to notice in that first year compared to when you then ended up finishing? Um, in my first year of university, I think I was very unsure of myself. Mm. And I also realised that I suck at French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I... It was funny, like I went into uni in my first year because when you do French at high school, um, you're not allowed to take a first year paper, you have to go straight into second year. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And that was such a leap, so everyone in my class had lived in France or they'd gone overseas and they were really good at speaking French and I'd just done my high school French classes. (laughs) Right. And it was really hard, so I I did terrible in those papers and Mm. so... I realized that I needed to reevaluate what I what I wanted to study. Yeah. Um which ended up being politics. So Okay, all right. So okay, now there's something that comes in that though cuz when most people I think people get the shock of their life when they come to university and they're mm-hmm. like, "Okay, it'll just be a step up from high school." Oh, and yeah, then they it's realize not. like it's actually so different. Like there's not there's not too much of a pathway into it. It's kind of like this no. is yeah. It, there's a very big leap from even like high school year 13 geography mm. and first year geography. Yeah. You have to take um, geography 101 and 102, which is one is a science based paper right. and one is sort of like a qualitative yep. um, arts paper. Mm. The science paper, I had no idea what I was doing that whole semester. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter how good your colouring pencils are. Yeah, but, no, yeah. it really doesn't. So, yeah. Yeah. There's so a very big leap and there's not much of a, like you said, like a pathway. 
yeah, but from then, year 13. But then even you dealing with it, like having to say that, okay, maybe, how, how did you realise that it wasn't that uni wasn't for you, it was just that these papers weren't for you? Because it's so easy to just be like, oh, I'm not cut out for this. Yeah. But then like you actually saw, maybe it's just that I'm not into this stuff, I'm, I'm going to go the politics route. Yeah, definitely. I think it was realising that, oh, I'm not very good at this, but there are things that I'm I'm good at. Right. And so like writing essays and that kind of stuff, mm. or like doing the readings and that kind of thing, I was like, I can do this. This is easy. It's just these aspects I wasn't very good at. And, right. But I'm still going to try and continue to do something that I'm good at. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then where did the dream for politics come in? Because I did a politics paper in my first semester, and that was kind of like my interest paper. Right. And I did quite well in that paper. So I was like, maybe this is something that I cons- could consider doing for my major. Mm. Um, and it was cool that I think what I liked about politics in my first year was that you could do different there would be papers based on different countries or different regions, right? Which I really liked being like coming from geography. Mm. So. And was a lot of your stuff then kind of tailored towards New Zealand and Pacific? Um, it was <laughs> no, not New Zealand actually. It was more international politics. Yep. Um, but the Pacific did come into it. And so one of my favourite papers at uni was a um, Pacific geopolitics paper, right? Which was really really awesome, which I really really enjoyed. And that's when I knew I kind of wanted to go down that path. Okay. In terms of having a yeah, a focus on like the Pacific. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. and then so from there you, you start building up stuff, and then you get into um, postgraduate. Yeah. Studies, right. Yeah. Because this is the stuff that I'm like I'm I'm really interested to like get your mind working on okay. and just go back and forth because okay. I feel like we've <laughs> had a few cool discussions about it before. Yeah. Um, and we get fired up, so that's where I want to get to. But okay. you, you do your honors. Yes, I did. I did my honors. And no one, uh, some people actually went before they come in. Weirdos like me mm-hmm. already know, like, okay, I'm going to do minimum of honors or I'm going to do a master's or, or a PhD yeah. or something like that. Did you have any, like, um, were you just going to go for your degree and then leave or did you have an idea you're going to do some sort of postgrad? Honestly, I had no idea. I had no plans to do postgrad. I didn't even know what o- an honors year was when I went <laughs> into my degree. <laughs> it wasn't really something that I guess you sort of talked about. Mm. Um, when you started your undergraduate degree in, ge- in geography, like I think maybe what you did is a bit different mm. because with PE, right? They, you they kinda, set it up. Yeah, yeah they yeah. set it up. So you don't really realise that that's something that you can do once mm. you finish your undergrad degree. Um, and so I kind of stumbled upon my honours by chance. So I was lucky enough to have someone um, within my, oh, sorry, it was like a student support person who told me that there was a scholarship available and that I'd be eligible to apply. So I just, uh, I applied and I, um, I ended up getting it. So right. yeah, I sort of just, Stumbled upon my honours, yeah. Right, so from that though, because like, I, I think people have a really misconstrued idea about what postgrad, postgrad study is. I think so too, and I think you don't realise that when you start your undergrad degree. Mm, mm. Yeah. And then when you did go into it, like you have to come up with a topic, you have to come up with mm-hmm. supervisors, like you actually had to plan a project to yeah. then go forward with. Yeah. Unless you have the training to be able to do that, like that mm-hmm. is such a daunting task. Like it if, is, If yeah. I could go back to my old me now and tell my, like, don't worry about that. That's not important. This is important. Mm. I would have like cruised through, but I think that's mm. all part of the process of, of like, is this for you? Yeah. So tell me about your your honors and and how it actually came about as yeah. a topic. As a topic, um, I think it was kind of we sort of talked about it um, before at the start of this episode. So yeah. like my experiences coming to New Zealand and sort of not knowing how I now identified myself. So yeah. I chose. Um, identity as sort of a topic for my honours but more importantly like how what does it mean to be a Pacific person in New Zealand cool. when you come from a minority Pacific community right. like Kiribati yeah. and what does that mean when you try and navigate like education spaces mm-hmm. Pacific education spaces and you were talking specifically I guess about the institution because like for your honours did you just narrow it down to experiences of um, experiences of a Kiribati um, tertiary students yeah yep. right so you oh so was it outside of Otago as well? No, it was just it was just Otago. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to put you on blast <laughs> like that. It's an honours though. It's an honours. It was an honours degree. Yeah. 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 So uh, from that, what I always find and what I always find fascinating is that people start <laughs> off with an idea in their mind, and then what did it end up turning into? Um, I think the idea in my mind it was something that had come out of my own personal experience. Right. And so then I was like, I wonder if other people have had the same experience. Mm. Um, and so I was able to talk to people who actually had, yeah, they were like, yeah, I have experienced this and yep. this is sort of what 
I went through and I was like, wow, so this issue isn't just confined to me. It's yeah. also something that other people struggle with or experience and they have their own ways with dealing with it. Yeah, and did you only look at ones who had come, like who had migrated to New Zealand or did you look at all who so just identify? It was Ekiribas, um students who had migrated to New Zealand and had gone through secondary school in New Zealand. Okay, yeah. right. And then when you were going through this, like what was some, because you also published a paper from it. Yeah, I did. And then from that, what were like the, for you, like the, firstly, the, the things that you're glad you highlighted because you knew they would be topics of interest. And then secondly, what were the things where you just like, that took me by surprise? Hmm. I think one of the things that was, like, sorry, the first question was what was important. Like, what what did you already kind of inherently know and then bring to the light? And then the second is just like, what the if That was, <laughs> that kind of hit me. Okay, yeah, something that I thought um, I wasn't that surprised by or that I kind of knew would be the case was just the way that Ikiribas students, I guess when you come from like a smaller Pacific community in New Zealand, you're kind of a minority within a minority. Yep. And so sometimes when you're in... Pacific spaces or spaces that are meant to be for you, mm. sometimes you can sort of feel a little bit like, is it for me? I don't see anyone here. I don't see my language represented here or I don't re- see my culture represented here. For sure. So you sort of, um, I guess you can sort of feel a little bit, ex- well, I wouldn't say excluded, but maybe a sense of exclusion and marginalisation in these spaces. Yeah. And then the one that took you by surprise? Um, that even though you can feel marginalised in a certain space, it can actually foster a sense of belonging Ooh. within your own community. Right. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise, that you can yeah. be at the same time excluded, but also feel a, a really massive sense of belonging to those that, who are also from where you're from or mm. your own community. Mm. And what was the language around that? Like, especially for, because you probably would have looked at international literature or other stuff that had come out. Like, is there, do they have theories around that or do they have like an actual term for that? Um, it was just more about how community can play a role in your like well being and For sense sure. of identity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is why I guess we're communal people. Yeah. Like that's all part of it. But then at the same time it can be your community that destroys you. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, goes, it goes both ways. You know? It does go both ways, yeah. yeah. And so for you to go through that process, like it's a it's a huge undertaking. Even if you only interview like a couple of people, that's like big time the stuff you're talking about. Identity, mm. belonging um, for people to, you know, even just highlight kind of inequities within their own stuff, mm. like that, that can be big. Did they give you any training on like how <laughs> to actually properly do this? Well, I think this is why I really like geography. So I did human geography, and they kind of set you up in that degree to be a researcher. Ah, that's so. Cool. Your first year is kind of like you learn the basics of like theory and things like that, and mm. then they slowly build you up to do research projects. Yep. So your second year, you do like a. Um, a mini sort of group research project and then in your last year you do a big research paper with like a group of four of you and you go to we went to Invercargill yeah (laughs) the year before went to Wanaka or somewhere in Queenstown I think um but yeah so I went to Invercargill that year and we did a big research paper so they kind of set you up to Mm. be able to do your honours if that's the if that's what you want to do right so like I mean so the research itself maybe in terms of that but like I, I always talk about, and it's something, something that I'm pretty big on now, and that's what I'm trying to research and get into, is this, like, the space that you create. Mm-hmm. The, um, and this is where I'm very interested in frameworks and frameworks that you used, and we've mm-hmm. had a discussion on this, on the one that you used for your honours, and how mm-hmm. that's got critiques, and we can get into that. Mm-hmm. But part of it is people sharing their stories, you need to be able to create a space where they're safe yeah. to share those stories. So yeah. you used a... I used a Kiribas research methodology. Yeah. Um, it was called. It's called Taone Taboni Naim, nice. which means to sit on the edge of your mat. Okay. Yeah. And what's the cultural significance of, of sitting on a mat? So, um, like a mat in a Kiribati setting, it's like it has a high sort of like um, social importance. So when you go and visit someone's house, you always sit on a mat, mm. and where you sit on that mat signifies sort of your relation to that person, ah, to your host. Right. And so if you're going to someone, I guess so. If I bring it back to my methodology, it's sort of a concept that's used in very sort of sensitive settings. Sure. So if you're going to speak to someone and it's kind of like a sensitive issue, you sit on the edge of the mat to sort of signify that you're sort of respecting that person by sitting on the edge of that mat. Right. You're not taking up space. You're sort of saying, this is your space and I respect that. Nice. And then from that, so like how do you then conduct your manner? So from that, do things just like fall into place or is there a specific protocol? Like once you're on the edge, you're kind of highlighting 
that this is kind of the space we're going to get into. Yeah. But then, like, what are the protocols that follow? Are there any, or is it just an open space for dialogue? It's an open space for dialogue. It's kind of more of like a like a symbolic meaning. Like, if I'm going to um, come to you and seek your knowledge about your experiences, then I'm going to respect that and sit on the edge of your mat and allow you to sort of lead the conversation and take up space in that way. Very nice. Yeah. Cool. So that was the, that was the framework that you used. Um, for you, though, like, you're going to meet with different people. I'm mm-hmm. assuming this is not the first time you meet with them. No. Like you, there, there's there's a lot of groundwork that actually goes in before the actual yeah. interview part starts. Yeah. I think w- with my experience, what was really cool to do for me was that I got to interview people that I had good relationships with. Right. So I got to interview people that were part of our sort of small Otago Kiribati community. Nice. So the people that I approached were people that felt comfortable with me and that I had a good relationship with Absolutely. already. Which is what you can do in social, like qualitative research. Yeah. Like that's something that um, actually adds value to your research if mm. you have a good relationship with the people that you're going to be interviewing or like working with. Yeah, and you don't get roasted for bias. Yeah. Which I did yeah. all <laughs> my entire ca- career. It's just yeah. always been like, yeah, but you know these people, isn't that going to bias like, but your that's results? the point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to be like, and I just cry for a little bit, like, am I even good at this? But anyway, sorry, to take it away. Um, but then something that I found really interesting and I always find interesting when we talk about frameworks mm-hmm. is other people who critique the kind of the, the specifics of a particular framework that you're mm-hmm. going to be using. I think there was something that you said around like the actual setting that it's used or. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, you remember that. Of course. Um, well, I, yeah. So with any sort of like um, framework or cultural framework, if you will, if you want to use it, there will always people that will have a different opinion yeah. or some or like a critique to have, which is good to have. Oh yeah. Um, but one of the critiques that with this framework is because so th- the person who came up with this was a master's student, so okay. I borrowed it from his master's. Nice. Um, and it was my dad, actually, that told me about this. Okay. Um, because he also was wanting to use the same frame, framework and suggest it to some other Kiribati researchers right. that he was, I think, tutoring. Mm. Um, and my dad suggested, oh, you can use this sort of Tauna Taboni Naim in your research. And they all laughed. <laughs> they laughed at him. And he was like, why are you laughing? And they were like, you just use that... you." You only use Tona Taboni Naim for like engagement. So, like, it's kind of like embarrassing. Like, I'm not getting married to this person. Oh. <laughs> so, sometimes it can be like, if you're not using it in the right context, it, mm. can, it can make people laugh. Sure. Yeah. But then also, it, maybe it's just like that's the only context that they've seen it being used. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, that, yeah. yeah. Right. Because it's like not necessarily. I'm guessing in the way that they've used it, it's not, they don't say that it's only like explicitly for these engagements. No, it's, it's just that it had a, like a connotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of being associated with Those like romantic re- yeah. relationships and things like that. Yeah. Wow. This, is, <laughs> this takes the research in its completely different area. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, um, something that I don't know if you want to talk about, you don't have to, it's fine, but okay, I want you to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you already know that we, so we came up, we came up with a research framework. Mm-hmm. And it's it's metaphorical. Yeah, yeah. Right? They are metaphorical, yeah. So when you are conducting yourself and you're not literally doing some of the things, unless you did, which mm-hmm. would have been cool, mm-hmm. um, but like how do you then set up a space? You don't have to give away too many secrets. You can just say, read the methods of my paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, how did you conduct yourself so that you did open that space up? Besides building the relationality from like a very earliest, uh, mm-hmm. earlier time point, for you, like, what was important when you then went into the space to then open it up? Kind of like what I've done for you. Yeah. Well, I guess when you use an Indigenous methodology, it can't just be, like, tokenistic. Like, you don't just do say you did this. Mm. There are things that you do, like, practical things that you do to oh, make yeah. sure that that person feels respected in that space. Yeah. Um, so I guess just, like, some little practical examples that I could use. Like, they weren't massive things. It was mm. just like, oh, why don't you choose a place that you, like, you would feel comfortable in to talk? Yep. Like. Or let me take you out for a coffee and we can chat that way. Like, yeah. make it a comfortable space and yeah. make that person feel like it's not this scary interview where they're being sit, sat down to, like, talk about things. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Make it feel like more of a conversation. For sure. Yeah. And I think the more conversation like, people are willing to then share rather than just say, I know what you want to hear. Yeah. Because we always find that with, like, clinical stuff is that 
we're like so you know you you talk about people know eating vegetables is good people know mm-hmm. getting out for exercise is good mm-hmm. if i'm a clinical like if i'm a clinical practitioner asking mm-hmm. you this stuff you're gonna yeah. be like yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like i know you're lying but like you're gonna give me what i want rather than just being like ah oh, this is my open views on whatever this issue is yeah yeah and so like not um having a set of questions that you're going to ask and yeah. just you know, yeah. go down the list. It's more like trying to facilitate conversation. Yeah. Did you find that there was a really good, like from that, well, it's kind of different because you actually already know them, but that there was no power dynamic? I think I was able to, yeah, counter that. Like there wasn't a power dynamic because mm. I had good relationships with these people. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I, I'm not, like I st- still have to do the work to make this person feel comfortable. That yep. doesn't mean I'm like, exempt from that yeah yeah because yeah. i always like when people talk about diminishing power dynamics between different things mm-hmm. i'm just like there will always be a hierarchy there is and i don't think it's about removing the high like you know yeah. that power dynamic it's being aware of it yeah and reflecting on how that will impact that person and how yeah. they're able to reply to your questions or talk about things that is a very good answer roy burnett so we Thank move you. on to the final <laughs> round no, we move on to the next round of this <laughs> conversation no that's that's awesome because i think uh, to use an Indigenous framework from the beginning, from the very first piece of research that you end up publishing on, yeah. it sets you up well for knowing that, okay, like all these other Western frameworks are like un- unnecessary. Well, they are necessary, but there are we have so many different ways of knowledge translation and sharing that we can just continue to use these and mm. they might be a bit more appropriate for the people that I want to be working with. Yeah. 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 So that's cool. So you publish that. Um, what's the sensitivities around that? Because I know you're publishing something and you're talking about a bunch of people. You've probably kept them anonymous, but some of the stories that do come out will probably highlight who they most likely are, hang mm-hmm. out with, stayed away from, mm-hmm. places like that. Like, do you then, like, how do you get to a point where you're sharing the trueness of it without hurting the ego of other people yeah. or other places? Uh, that's a really like, important thing that you have to be aware of when you're doing research especially in like a a small a specific context Mm. or you're interviewing like from a from a community who you might be able to identify people um so it was about inform like letting my um the people that I talked with know that and also being careful to just not reveal any information like when I include that in my thesis or Mm. like in the article yeah Mm. so just you know changing the names of people like keeping it anonymous things like that and then, so, because, I mean, when we talk about communities, and I said before, some communities can kill you, <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's very easy to start talking about the types of things that these communities did, and then just <laughs> people reading it and being like, is that the, and then just yeah. like going like that. So like <laughs> when I said the places that people stay away from, or people that people stayed away from, or just like some of the main issues being something, how do you do it in like an academically elegant way, where you're saying... <laughs> Like you're roasting something, but like you kind of didn't directly attack something. Yeah, well, you just don't directly name the the spaces or the people that they're you know talking about. It right. can just be like um, in specific spaces. Okay. This person oh, right. could feel a certain way. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not like schmoker. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't make up a, a weird name. Okay. No. All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's cool. And then from there, you then. So this is another thing that I'm very interested on, and we had um, we had someone who was in the volunteering space on uh, just before you, oh, yes. uh, because you went back. I sure did. Is that your was that your like first time actually spending a prolonged period of time there? It was my first time uh, spending like living there, living yeah. and working back in Kiribati. It was my first time, yeah. Yeah. So you, so what's the time frame from your honours to going? It was as soon as I finished my honours, I went over to Kiribati. One ticket, please. Yeah. <laughs> and then you went over. How did that uh, whole thing come about? Um, so I volunteered with VSA, so yeah. that's New Zealand's Volunteer Service Abroad. Nice. And they do what is called a Univol program. Uh-huh. Um, and if you are studying geography or something related to development studies and right. you're, in your, you're in your last year, you can apply for their Univol program. Yep. Um, and they send you to somewhere in the Pacific where you can volunteer for, about, for, a t- for 10 months. Cool. So I did. I, I applied. Yeah. Um, and I got sent back to Kiribati. Did you get sent there or did you put it as a preference? So when you apply, so the way that VSA works is they only send volunteers to where there is a need. So um. if a specific community has said, oh, we would love someone with these skills for this project, do you have anyone? Then they will try and match you up with a specific place. But in saying that, as a uni vol, you can sort of specify what areas you would prefer and they will try if they can to match you to a place. Right. 
Um, but it was a weird. I did not think I would go back to Kiribati at all because yeah. when I applied, they um, they said that uni voles don't get sent to Kiribati. <laughs> Why? But, well, they said that it is a bit of a harsh environment for a oh, uni vol. All right. <laughs> yeah. We're slumming it. We're slumming it. And then you say, watch your mouth. That's where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they were concerned that for a uni student, it is a bit of a tough place because you can feel a little bit isolated in Kiribati because it, it, it's, it's hard to live in Kiribati if you're not from there. Yep. Um, but I applied and because I'm from there and I have family over there, they're like, you'll be fine. Yeah. So yeah. they sent me by myself. Uni vols usually go in pairs. Yeah. It's I'm your blood myself. too. Yeah. Like that's your that's your people. That is my people. Yeah, so we'll get we'll get there soon. But okay, you said <laughs> okay. one thing in that little first part there. So we won't no, you've already named them, so now I can't be like okay. okay. When they say a community need, yeah. Do you genuinely believe that it is community need? I think um I do like the way in which they develop volunteer assignments. So they work in partnership right. with communities. So they will try and reach out and say, well, first of all, build a relationship with NGOs and government ministries and things like that. And a, a de- an assignment is developed once a particular um, partner has identified that they need a certain skill. Cool. Or something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, think, I feel like there's some caveats, but <laughs> <laughs> we've already named them, so we can't go back yeah. and, yeah. Okay, so there's, there's a few ways that you're not, you know, but then again, when you are assigned the right person to the right job, it, it then comes on that person to then make sure that they're, you know, properly going in and doing the right work. Yeah. So it's, wait, sorry, what do you mean? Like so you know how you're talking about community interests and then mm-hmm. making sure that they're doing it right. But then you also have to send in someone who's not necessarily from that place. So, like, there, there's just a lot of moving parts yeah. of bringing in external Externals, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it is difficult when you send someone into a context that they have no familiarity with. Yeah. Um, and there can be lots of sort of um, things around, like, you know, you're not aware of the local culture or you yep. don't know those kinds of things. So that can be a little bit difficult when yep. you're going into a community and you don't know these things. For sure. So VSA tries to prep us before we go. Cool. So we'll have like a, a briefing. It's only a week long briefing. Right. <laughs> but you sort of, um, yeah. 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 And then from that, because something that we are very aware of as well, because we do have uh, a lot of volunteers who come over, a lot of expats who come over as mm. well. Uh, and a lot of our own Cook Islanders who do have skills mm. and jobs get taken by expats or mm. by people who come over and volunteer their services who aren't mm. homegrown. Yeah. Um. So, like, being aware of that stuff, is that something that they – or that you're more kind of – you have a heightened awareness of? Like, even as the person who's from there yeah. but didn't grow up there and going back to do stuff, like, w- did you become aware of that? Definitely. You yeah. see that a lot in yeah. Kiribati in that a lot of – jobs rely on bringing um external yeah. expertise in for yeah um and i don't think it's that well sometimes there are people like equity based people or local people who have the skills to do those jobs but often as well it's about there aren't even opportunities to be able to to get that skill into the country for the capacity, for the, to, for yeah, capacity yeah. to grow so yeah. it's like people can't even have that opportunity themselves to go mm. and study abroad to be able to come back and and right. and do those things, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. So I mean, it's just so many different things, and it's like, are, are we overall leading to some sort of net good? Yeah. Or is it more destructive than it is constructive? Good. I think with volunteering, I don't, because I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, I think volunteering on its own should never be the end goal. Like, it should be volunteering with the goal that you don't need volunteers anymore. I like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, really really good. And I think with. That is, this is also why I liked VSA is because they built capacity building into uh, volunteer assignments. So nice. a big thing is if you go into a community, you don't just do the work, you have to build capacity. Yep. So you have to work with people, yep. you have to transfer skills, you have to leave being able to show that I've done this and um, people will be able to take that job forward without me being there. I like that. Yeah. And then from there, you're doing it, you've done an honours before, you're, you're, you're technically a researcher, <laughs> you're over there. Did you ever have a research hat on? Like, this would be something really interesting to examine. Um, I think, yes, there were a lot of moments where I'd be like, oh, this would be really interesting for a research project. But mm. more in the way that um, 
the whole development and aid space sorts, sort of works back home. So what we're talking about, like capacity building, but also people coming in and taking jobs and sort of, mm. yeah. What was your particular role when you had to go over? So I did two assignments okay. back home. The first one, I was a just an admin assistant. So they just needed someone that could like um, answer emails yep. and sort of organise things like that. Yep. Um, so I was working with a women's organisation who had no like um, – because it's really hard to own like a computer back home. So like just not even knowing how those sort of systems work, like they just needed someone to teach the staff how to how to like use Excel, how to use like, things like that, just very basic like IT skills. Um, so that was kind of the role that I had mm. when I went back. Mm. Yeah, I've seen you on a computer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if they should. Have. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. um, and it was on a new, uh, an, on a nutrition project. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, so that was my first assignment. Right, and then your second. Second, I went back, and my official title was youth development advisor. But oh. so I was volunteering with another women's organization who were wanting to try and reach out to youth to sort of join this organization that is has a long history in Kiribati but was sort of seen as something that old women join. Ooh, <laughs> right. Yeah. And why is there the connotation of that? Is it just because most of the demographic was old women? It's just the way that the organization was set up okay. to begin with. So right. it was about women um, and teaching women skills to be good wives. That's how it started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. We'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on this before we step on. Okay, teaching women to be good wives. This is like the very colonial roots. Who started this, a man? The colonists, the colonizers. <laughs> Who was probably a man? <laughs> yeah. What? Well, this is, you know, back, um, this is where a lot of w- women's organizations in the Pacific have their roots is from very colonial Absolutely. beginnings. And so you have women's groups that started in the 60s and the 70s that were about teaching women skills to be good homemakers or to be good wives. Because in the colony, when, you know, you gain independence, women are going to need to play a certain role in the new nation For sure. And so that was what these women's organisations were about. Okay. So that's where they started. That's where they started. And then they're starting to transform. And now, yeah, these women's organisations are needing to keep up with the times. And so the the organisation that I was with was starting to realise, well, we need to sort of engage young women because mm. now young women aren't just homemakers. They're yeah. leaders. They're, um, you know, business owners. They're yep. going to be politicians. Yep. So, yeah. But does that then bleed into the culture? How do you mean? Of like, just like the inherent value of different genders. <laughs> yeah well yeah, yeah it, it challenges some long-standing norms about the roles of women and things like that but sure. that's also changing norms change yeah yeah that's what no, that's what i mean i was just like doesn't wouldn't that have then bled into generations of people who then see women as only this yeah because these are groups that I'm, I'm assuming are set up so that you know women have freedom so yeah. that they like that with quote marks for people who aren't watching they have the freedom we've given you this yeah but actually you're still serving the overall purpose that we have like the agenda that we've set for you yeah i don't know if i'm reading into that too much is that kind of well i think um you definitely face those kinds of views when you do um like uh, i guess you could say women gender equality work or women's work in the pacific it's like you're kind of challenging the norms around what women's roles yeah. have been for so long yeah but also, like, women's roles or these norms, have are they have they been around for so long or were these norms imposed through colonisation as well? Yeah. So, you, yeah, you, you're challenging a lot of, like, ideas, but yeah. you have to challenge where these ideas came from. Too. Yeah, for sure. And that's where I always say that's the, that's the like, that's true colonisation is where our own people start to believe. And they're just like, that's just the way it is. And yeah. Like, Wait, why is it the way it is? Oh, yeah. my God, that's not <laughs> yeah. how we used to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, that's such a powerful tool. It is, it is, yeah. I'm not a good tool, but <laughs> it's not a powerful. Um, so okay, so we've moved on from that. You you you've done your work in there, and then mm-hmm. your ten months is up. Mm-hmm. You come back, mm-hmm. and then I meet you. Yeah, like kind of a couple months after. Yes, yeah, straight after actually. So yeah, I got a job here. Yeah, at PDO. Yeah, right. Where so we are we right now. Yeah, we won't talk about <laughs> that one too much because <laughs> I feel like it really knocked you back if you, in terms of research, mm-hmm. uh, then you needed to get away and then you actually started research. And this is something that I know very little about. You went away and did a master's. I did my I master's. I don't know much about your topic. All I know is that you'd call me sometimes being like, I'm, I'm stressed. Trash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what did you actually do? <laughs> oh man, my you, master's. I mean, yeah. you were involved in so many different things and you were like my classic case study for 
a burnt out master <laughs> student. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how I just really do not like <laughs> master students or PhD students because we have such small resource. We know that. We know that mm-hmm. there's a limited workforce to be able to do stuff. Mm. But then we end up carrying the burden of the limited resource and then no one gets to the finish line. And then we end up hating it and then no one wants yeah. to go through. So yeah. you ended up on a baj- like a bajillion different things. I did. I yeah. did so many side quests. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then like at the end, you didn't even have a cool crown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but so you, what was your actual master's? My actual master's was, again, based off of my experiences volunteering. Yeah. So I did a master's that was focused on development projects back home in Kiribati that are looking to address gender equality. Cool. Um, and the kinds of like, narratives that exist back home around culture and gender issues. Nice. Yeah. So. I like this. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I think we need so, to put a bit of time into this. Yeah. So like one of the things that I, I sort of found when I was doing my literature review is that there's these very conflicting ideas around culture and gender right. back in Kiribati. So on the one hand, there's people that say, oh, Kiribati culture, it's so, so sexist. It's so like patriarchal. It's, you know, like it's very... um bad for women and then on the other hand like at the same time you'll hear people say that's like not the case like culture is like very empowering for women it's through culture that we can address issues of gender and so there were just just these conflicting views around around those kinds of things and so I wanted to know well why is that and who are saying these things and what impact does that have for how we design programs to 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 address gender-based violence and things like that. Yeah yeah and then uh, what did you end up finding did you uh, did you interview people from Kiribati? Yes, so yeah. I interviewed people, women, so back in Kiribati, but also some women who are involved with um, gender work in New Zealand yeah. with Kiribati communities. Nice, yeah, nice. And then from there, like, what did you end up deducing from all of that? Um, key takeaway would be that in the like when we design projects for gender issues back home in Kiribati, we just don't centre Kiribati voices enough nice. in these projects uh-huh. in the project design phase. Uh-huh. So. It's such a complex issue, and we sort of talked about it before around how there are like colonial ideas of women, but it's so difficult to unpack what's a colonial mentality and what's part of culture now because it's so intertwined. Mm. But we just don't have those spaces to have these conversations, yeah. and they're really important to be able to sort of pinpoint where these sort of like toxic um, views or attitudes can come from. Sure. And Maybe not toxic, like harmful views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you use like a uh, like a some sort of feminist approach to it, or yeah, I did. Nice. I used the decolonial feminist approach, right? Which sort of argues that like categories of women and men, or understandings of like gender relations, we we really need to be critical of and where these ideas come from. Yep. And and use a decolonial lens on these things. Right. Yeah. Cool. And and that's getting to the root of why people have the thoughts they have. Yeah. Right. Like, how do you have? Um, oh, there's so many different ways to say it, but like, how did the hegemonic view mm. of whatever is normal yeah. become constructed as the norm? Yeah, yeah. So it's all, it's about being critical of everything, of every sort of common truth that you might think you have around gender issues. Like, yeah. be critical of it. Yeah. Where does it come from? Why do, Why do we have these like, these views? And who's perpetuating these views? Yeah, yeah. And and the I think the the cool thing about what Gramsci was was doing when he developed all of that stuff is that there's actually like a two way thing so like like you said norms change over time but Mm -hmm. like then when they do change who is the one who's creating this norm and what's their agenda of of, of, overall things you get to look at that sort of stuff yeah yeah which I love I love this kind of stuff when it comes to research because yeah you get to sort of question everything yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but then sometimes (laughs) see now with this and research like sometimes you're just like Oh, we should just do nothing. Like, this is, this is so <laughs> yeah. much. I'm, I'm, I've done so much analysis. I found that nothing works. <laughs> that was literally my whole university degree. Is actually everything's just really complicated. Yeah, that's it. That's everything. But that doesn't mean we need to give up. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we are the future. Um, yeah. And then from so you're you're trying to do that, which is mm-hmm. huge in itself because that takes a lot of brain power. That takes it a does. lot of like. Okay, that connects to this, which connects to that. And then they're like, oh, you know, you're only doing a master's. Hey, Roy, want to do this stuff uh, too? Yeah. What other, other stuff are you doing? Don't name people. Okay. But can I name projects? Yes, or no? Or just describe the project, them? Name the projects. Okay. That's fine. I did a lot, man. <laughs> I was working with this. No. <laughs> um, so last year, I um, got to work on a number of projects. One of them was a human rights measurement initiative. So yep. that's like an organization who are trying to measure. Um, 
the progress of countries in terms of how well they're meeting their human rights obligations. Cool. So it like creates like an index of... Yeah, it's quite cool. They kind of create like a measurement and you can sort of compare how well countries are doing to each other. Right. Um, so that was one of them. Yep. Um, another one was I tutored a paper. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, I wrote a paper for nice. a completely different research project whilst I was doing my master's. Um, and then another one, another project I was working with... Um, some like feminist researchers who developed this website to share Pacific gender research and make it more accessible to students and, and cool. researchers. Cool. And what was your f- like? Honestly, you had your masters, yes. but what was your like? What became kind of like the central part of you? So when you were going into different places and you're going into the different research, what did you start to see as your strength bringing into the different projects that you were doing? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I think maybe like just bringing a different perspective on things and being able to transfer research, like, I guess, lenses into different spaces and seeing things from a different perspective or a different point of view. So, like, the human rights one, for example, I came from, like, a qualitative background, but everyone on there obviously came from, like, a quantitative, like, analysis kind of thing. Yeah, from the best side. (laughs) (laughs) But that that was really cool because you got to see how both work together to, to be able to better understand issues is that it's not, like... Yeah, qualitative research can really complement quantitative analysis yeah. and you get a bigger and fuller picture of why things are happening and things mm. like that. So that was quite cool. Mm. Yeah. That's the powerful stuff. Mm. Like I am not a qualitative researcher. I think I'm a qualitative mind and a quantitative researcher. Oh, that's Cause, cool. Because <laughs> I do like, I like thinking philosophically about the numbers that we get mm-hmm. and I'm just like, ah. Oh. Yeah, well I guess you're, you're only reading one page or like you're only seeing one side of yeah. things and to be and to be like open to the fact that we can only explain so much mm. not many quantitative researchers do that because mm. apparently we've explained we know it all. all yeah yeah um so you, you you take that stuff in and if you were to put a proposal together mm-hmm. to do a pay, phd from all the stuff that you've just learned over this time because you've learned some really cool stuff mm. what would you like what are what are th- the main things that have jumped out and really kind of indicated to you that that's your passion um i'd say gender research is something that i really want to get into i think that is something that's often missing but it's a cross-cutting issue so anything that you do in terms of research like a gender component or a gender lens would definitely be valuable Mm -hmm. in certain spaces is that is it does that answer your question that were you asking that's what i asked okay good just checking but what would you like to do for a phd yeah, maybe more. Maybe even just an external research project. Um, like what's something that has come out, or that you even indicated within your masters as like this is a future area of research that needs more mm. work. I think I'd love to continue doing that sort of decolonial feminist stuff in sure. the Kiribati context. Yep. Um, just f- the term feminist in the Pacific is such a like controversial term, right? But there's so much to unpack that we just don't talk about. Right. And learning, or like doing the research that I did for my master's and sort of like going into the colonial history of Kiribati, that was so fascinating and we just don't talk about it enough. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. So I'd love to do that. Yeah. That'd be really cool. And then how much do you run into, so, I mean, with feminists and, and with gender stuff in mm-hmm. general, mm-hmm. and then we have a lot of, you know, the gender is a wide spectrum now. Of like yeah. of, of of other things, and those are probably things that when these when these views or when these lenses were first created, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It was with the binary. Yeah. So now, like, how does that? Uh, is there is there room to then allow that or to come in as well? Well, I think um, what you said about it was created with the binary. Well, who created the binary? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, like, a lot of um, what I like about decolonial feminist research is it's about going back to tracing back the roots of certain ideas and mm. so where did the binary come from and who mm. used it and did all societies have a binary yeah and some places didn't some places weren't structured around a gender binary or a sex binary right um some places sex and gender didn't really have that much of an impact on how people organized it would be age or status or your yeah. kinship ties yeah so that's a really interesting thing too yeah my thing's always around like use and like what are people's skills what yeah. Are people, like, what are they able to do? Are they able to fulfill this? And I'm like, and sometimes, yeah, like the the division of sex or gender was like a that wasn't the key thing that organized it. Was based on 
who was more suited for certain things and happened to be, yeah. you know, like the gender stuff came after. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> I was, it's so weird. I still find it like so fascinating that a lot of our research is like, how do we get back to how it was before everyone came and done messed it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's impossible to know that, like how things were exactly before. Yeah. So because everyone wants to go live on Facebook, so we can't, <laughs> we can't take that away from them. That <laughs> yeah. um, is really cool. I think I do think you should ponder that a little bit more. Yeah, and I, I know you want to take a break from research a little bit because you, yeah. you girl done done burnt out and stuff. Yeah. But I think you're you're in a very uh, cool space and a space that I'm. It's kind of coming out of now because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm moving away from, you know, my student years, but you just come in with so many fresh ideas mm-hmm. and things that we become institutionalized. Like we, we mm. spend time here, we publish papers, we do all this other stuff and we're following the rules because that's how we stay employed. Mm-hmm. But when you're that new energy coming through, <laughs> you're energy. like, you're like, why are you still doing it like this? And like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. Like it's a really, I think that fresh energy. And if you come in, being fresh and ready to take it on it's mm-hmm. a really cool place to be yeah. so if you want to do it um do i think it. you should yeah and i think you should come back on the podcast <laughs> uh halfway through it and then we can compare roy now to roy then yeah that'd be cool that'd be really cool um so i have one question that i ask everyone on this podcast and i'll ask you as well because i don't really know you that well but yeah what is something you do every day or close to every day that makes you feel like you've optimized the day Mm, when I do one little thing for myself, that makes me feel like I've made the most of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you do you prioritize it or do you write it down as the thing I'm going to do or do you just on a whim be like, I'm going to do this? I think I wake up being like, if I ha- if I do one thing today that makes me feel good about myself or that I enjoy, then I feel like I've had a good day. Could that also be? Could be the, a little thing or like a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any examples? Um, like eating my favorite breakfast. Nice. <laughs> That's a little example. Could it also be you rejecting things because you don't want to do it? Yeah, exactly. Saying no to things. Yeah. That could be something too. Okay. So it's yeah. not necessarily doing something. It's just putting yourself in a space to, to be happy. Yeah. 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 And pr- prioritizing yourself. Cause I think that was one thing that I learned last year was having to do so much. I sort of forgot that I hey, I can do things just for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that that's a really good place to, to just go for a few minutes. When you did have all those other things, like one of the things that you would talk to me about is just like, how do I get off this? <laughs> because like, I think a lot of us feel like we have this obligation once we say yes to things or once someone approaches you for something and says, this is a good opportunity, you need to take this because you're always worried that you're not going to have that shot again. Yeah. Like when you did have the conversation to be like, hey, I'm dying here. <laughs> like, how received was it? Like, was it well received? Was it worth all of that uh, that anxious or that tension before having to have the conversation? Often, people are fine with it. <laughs> You'll say, ah, oh, I can't do it. And they're like, that's fine. Yeah. And you're like, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mean I could have asked this earlier? <laughs> yeah, so people are actually really, people are, are nice more often than they are rude, I find, with these things. And so if you don't have the capacity to do something, just say it. Yeah. And people will understand. Well, something I've been been really wrestling with for the last couple of (sighs) years is just remembering that you're, you just can't do good if you're not happy. Yeah. And if you're doing stuff for the people that you care about, Mm -hmm. you're kind of letting them down Mm -hmm. by by not being you and not, and, and kind of burning out. Yeah, yeah, of course. If you're not staying true to yourself, then you, how can you stay true to other people or, you know, yeah. do things for other people? Yeah, no, that's really, really cool. So your 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 mission over the next little bit, sorry, I've got to lead into your final project. So you're on a project right now. Yeah, it seems yeah. to be some cool stuff. Do you just want to plug that quickly? Yeah, okay, real quick. So no, I go as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of a research group or a research project um, that is looking to understand Um, migration or human mobility is what we call it in the Pacific in the context of climate change. So understanding and looking into why people move or they don't move um, in the context of climate change. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So So uh, as part of that, you get to work with some cool people, you get to go talk to some cool people and you just get to find out a whole bunch. Yeah, basically. So yeah, so this is, you're at the very beginning of it, right? It's very, very early stages right now. Yep. So we're still in that planning phase, um, but we know where, we want to go, so it will be across seven different Pacific countries, which nice. is really exciting, Kiribati being one of them. Nice. Um, yeah. 
Very cool. So yeah. So yeah, I think when that does, I think when you've when you've had an idea about what your PhD wants to be, I'd say in about a year, it'll be a really good place to be able to talk to you again. Um, because this yeah, stuff, this stuff intrigues me. It's so, oh gosh, like we only recorded an hour of it, but then we'll probably talk for two hours after this <laughs> yeah. about more of it and just like will. get through the whole thing. Roy, I've really, really appreciated this. Thank you. It's been awesome. Yeah. Did Thank you, you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. Thank you for having me. That's um weird because I knew I know you. Like, I, I know. know you so well. Yes. And then when we get into this conversation, like, it starts off a little bit weird because you're just like, oh, this is going to be weird. And then yeah. we start getting into it. And I was like, no, that's right. That's why we're friends. <laughs> yeah. Because that's how we talk. Mm-hmm. So I've really, really appreciated your time. Thank you for sharing. Thank um, you. And I think, yeah, no, I think a lot of people will take a lot of different things from this, even to know that it's called Kitty Bass and oh, not yeah. Kitty Butty or Kitty Bus. Yes. Yeah. 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 And Kitty Bass Language Week. It's just a quick plug. Woohoo. <laughs> 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 All right, cool. Okay. cool. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Bye.